All right, so welcome back everyone to this fifth and final part of our RSET training series on the NASA Atmospheric Composition Ground Networks, which support air quality and climate applications. Today, uh, I'm joined by Dr. Judd Welton, who's a principal investigator of the MPLNet network out of the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. And in this part, our objectives will be to identify the basic characteristics of the MPLNet instruments, which are used by NASA for ground-based active remote sensing of aerosols, clouds, and the planetary boundary layer, or PBL. We'll also be recognizing how MPLNet sustains long-term global observations of the atmosphere and supports air quality and climate applications, and how it can complement satellite observations as well. And finally, we'll be showing you how to access relevant MPLNet data for given locations and application purposes. Just a reminder of the other networks we've gone through in this training so far. We've looked at AeroNet and Pandora, which are passive remote sensing instruments looking at aerosols and trace gases respectively. And then in our last session, we learned about TollNet, which is an active instrument uh, also using LIDAR which looks at ozone in the atmosphere. And today we'll be learning about, as I said, MPLNet, the MicroPulse LiDAR network, which is another active remote sensing instrument, but this time looking at aerosols and uh, the planetary boundary layer and clouds. As a reminder, if you have any questions during this session, please put them in the question and answer box in the WebEx. Uh, there's three dots in the lower right corner of the WebEx interface that will bring up the Q&A box. You can put your questions in there at any time during the training, and we'll answer all those questions together at the end of the training session today. We'll also be collecting the answers together in a question and answer document, which will be posted on the website about a week after the training. And now, without further ado, I'll hand things over to Dr. Judd Welton to teach us about the MicroPulse LiDAR Network, or MPLNet. Over to you, Judd. All right, thanks, Carl, for the introduction. I'll be discussing the MicroPulse LiDAR network today. Before I get started, I want to recognize my colleagues. I'm the principal investigator, Judd Welton, at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. I have a staff shown on the slide here that are comprised of people working on the operational aspects of the network, as well as my science team. And of course, we have all of our international network partners that contribute substantially to the project. And finally, Aeronet, who we've worked closely with since the beginning. Here's the agenda for my presentation. I'll begin with an introduction and an overview on LiDAR basics. Then I'll talk about the MPLNet project and the data we provide. I'll do a tour of the MPLNet website and uh, demonstrate how you access our data. I'll go over some case study examples, and then I'll conclude with a discussion on how you can access global LiDAR data beyond MPLNet. So I'll begin with our introduction. MPLNet was funded in 1999 and began operations in 2000. The original goal was to develop a long-term global LiDAR network to profile aerosol and cloud vertical distribution and properties at AeroNet sites. With the goal of, of uh, providing information for the bulleted items shown here, MPLNet is funded by the NASA Radiation Sciences Program and Earth Observing System, and we have significant contributions from our site partners. The pictures shown here are a few of our sites around the world. The green beam that you see there is, the, is from our LIDAR. It is normally not visible. These are long exposure photographs. So I'll begin with an overview of backscatter LIDAR, which is the type of LIDAR we use in the MPLNet project. And note that LIDARs are like radars, but instead of using microwaves, we use laser light. Radars profile clouds, rain, severe weather, they use microwaves with a longer wavelength because that's ideal to look at scattering from the thick, larger particle layers like clouds and rain. Backscatter LIDARs profile aerosol and cloud structure, and we do that using visible light with a shorter wavelength, which is more ideal to look at smaller particles like aerosols. The LIDARs work by transmitting short pulses of laser light into the atmosphere. A small portion of that light bats backscatters at 180 degrees from particles in the atmosphere, it's collected by a telescope and recorded using the detector and a data system. The so MPLNet uses this type of elastic backscatter LIDAR. 
There are also advanced LIDARs that also profile aerosol and clouds using different techniques such as Raman and high spectral resolution. Also other types of LIDARs that measure winds, ozone, uh, etc. I'll focus on elastic backscatter LIDAR in this presentation. So the LIDARs obtain optical proxies of the aerosol and cloud concentration, composition, and shape. We start by getting the altitude or the range of the particle layer, which we determine from the time between the pulse transmission and the reception of the signal back in the LIDAR. The light's attenuated as it travels up and back through the atmosphere by scattering and absorption. That in total is referred to as extinction. So it's the backscatter and extinction parameters in our measured signals that are the optical properties of aerosol and clouds. That's what, we're, that's what we want to get from the data. The laser light's often polarized in one orientation, and the scattering by non-spherical particles like dust or ice clouds depolarizes the light by an amount proportional to the non-sphericity of the particles. So the polarized LIDARs can measure what we call the depolarization ratio. It's, and that is proportional to the particle's degree of non-sphericity. So again, the idea is that the remote sensing data from our LIDAR provides optical proxies for the vertical profiles of aerosol and cloud concentration, composition, and shape. On this slide, I'm showing an example of a LIDAR signal on the left. The x-axis is the signal strength, and on the y is the altitude. The blue line is a molecular only signal, so that's assuming there are no aerosol and clouds uh, present. The green line is a measured LIDAR signal that's been calibrated. You can see that the signals start out very high and then they gradually decrease with range. That's because the signal is being attenuously, uh, continuously attenuated as it propagates through the atmosphere. You'll also notice on the right, this is the depolarization ratio. And again, there's a molecular baseline. The molecular atmosphere does depolarize light a little bit. And in green, you can see the measured volume depolarization ratios, and they're measured in percent. So on these plots, anywhere you see the green uh, signal or the green depolarization ratio greater than the molecular background, that is uh, due to the presence of aerosols or clouds. Micropulse LiDAR network uses the Micropulse LiDAR. That's shown here on this slide. Uh, it's the first uh, instrument to the left. It was the first commercially available autonomous iSafe LiDAR, and it's iSafe at a green wavelength. It's suitable for network operations because it can run continuously. It was originally developed at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in the early 1990s. It was patented and then licensed for commercial use. The license has since expired uh, but over time, the instrument has continued to be sold by numerous companies, and at the moment, it's available from droplet measurement technologies. The instrument acquires atmospheric profiles from 250 meters to 30 kilometers at one minute temporal resolution, and this instrument became polarized around 2008. Unfortunately, the MPL itself is no longer available. Uh, we're now using uh, the mini MPL shown to the right. This was an offshoot development of the original MPL. It's the same basic design and performance. It's smaller, easier to ship, uh, but it does have a slightly lower signal to noise ratio. So the primary job of MPLNet is to install and operate these sites and collect and archive the data. We then calibrate the instruments and transform the raw data to a level one signal product. And this is a signal in a form that is usable. We retrieve cloud and aerosol and PBL properties, and we also provide level 1.5 and 2 quality assured products. Finally, we provide the data products to the public, and all of our data is open and available, just like Aeronet. And then, of course, we assist with interpretation of the data and collaborative research. So this slide, I will discuss how we transform raw data to the atmospheric parameters um, and the signal that uh, we then use to retrieve backscatter and extinction. So as a reminder, it's these two parameters represented by beta and sigma, backscatter and extinction, that we're after. I'm, demonst I'm showing the uh, signal plot to the right again. And at top, this is the equation form of the signal shown in the plot. We call this NRB, or normalized relative backscatter. I've broken up the terms into molecular and particle. 
or aerosol and cloud. So you see that our signals we're measuring are directly proportional to the backscatter at a given altitude or range. Then they're attenuated by two transmission terms. The first transmission term here is, the molec is, is due to molecular scattering. The other transmission term in the end is due to aerosol and cloud attenuation. And this integral term in the exponent is actually the aerosol optical depth from the surface to that range. So there's a connection back to uh, Aeronet, for instance, that you've heard earlier in the training. There are a number of calibrations and instrument parameters that we have to uh, process in order to produce the LIDAR signal you see on the right. Those include the laser energy, the solar background. The sun does emit some light at the laser wavelength, and we have to subtract that. Uh, interestingly enough, that uh, signal noise for us is the entire signal for Aeronet. And we, of course, have the range and the diagnostic temperatures. There are numerous calibrations that must be applied to the data. They include uh, accounting for the performance of the detector, laser detector crosstalk, and we call this afterpulse. That's an artifact of the MPL design. Uh, it's a transceiver, so when the laser fires, the detector sees a little bit of that signal, and we have to subtract it. Then we have receiver overlap, which is a calibration for the near range signal loss, and I'll discuss that on the next slide. And then finally, we calibrate the polarization to produce accurate depolarization ratios. There's one instrument uh, parameter we do not uh, remove from the signal, and that's called the LIDAR receiver efficiency parameter, or C, sometimes called the LIDAR constant. And that's shown in the equation here. So this is what would convert our signal units to SI units. And in the appendix of the slide deck, I provide more in-depth discussion of the LIDAR signals, calibration, and our processing techniques. So on this slide, I'm showing the same two signals in green and in red what the signal looks like with no, with no calibrations applied. So on the right, uh, you can see if there's no after pulse calibration applied, we end up with slightly too high signals due to that noise term. It may not look like much on the slide on the scale shown here, but these can interfere with our retrieval algorithms. In addition, we do a slight range correction. You can see a little bit of difference in range at the base of the cloud here at about 12 kilometers. The overlap calibration is shown at the bottom where you can see using the LIDAR, we're not able to accurately image signals closer to the surface. So we account for that using uh, a separate receiver channel that has a very wide field of view and a very short overlap. Polarization calibrations are done with both lab and measured data. There's an example shown to the right. I'll discuss interpreting LIDAR data on the next few slides. Our LIDAR data is often displayed as a 2D representation of the atmosphere shown on the right, where the x-axis is time and the y-axis is altitude. The data variable you're plotting at any time and altitude is represented by a color map as shown here. So I'm showing the LIDAR signals in the top plot from one of our MPLNet sites in Barcelona, and you can see aerosol near the surface in some high altitude clouds around 10 kilometers. And I want to focus on these uh, mid tropospheric layers around uh, five to seven kilometers. If you look at them, they look like the signal is weaker or less than the signals near the boundary layer. The same with this layer here towards the end of the day, if you can make it out. And I want to remind you that, again, the signals are being attenuated as they propagate through the atmosphere. So you cannot, you cannot make a conclusion about the concentration in these layers relative to those below from the LIDAR signal alone. We have to do retrievals of the aerosol properties to do that. On the bottom, I'm showing the volume depolarization ratio. And again, you, I want to remind you that this variable is, uh, indicates the sphericity of the particles, not the concentration. So the higher values of depolarization indicate more non-spherical particles, and you can see that in the ice clouds up around 10 kilometers relative to the aerosols near the boundary layer. But the volume depolarization ratio we measure from the signals is not the same thing as the aerosol or the cloud depolarization. So again, we have to do retrievals of the properties uh, to, to get an accurate measure of what the particle depolarization is. And that's shown on the next slide here. And I'll discuss our aerosol retrievals later in the presentation. 
But if you look at retrievals of aerosol backscatter, you'll see that those weak signal layers aloft actually correspond to backscatter that's very comparable to what's near the surface, the same near the end of the day. And if you look at the aerosol depolarization ratio retrievals, you'll see that they're higher than the volume depolarization ratio. So next I'll move on to discussing the project and our data. On this slide, you can see our sites on the map. These are sites from 2000 to current. The green dots are operational sites. The red are, are closed and the yellow are planned. We have 85 sites in total. Uh, 28 are currently operational and we have about 10 sites in planning phase. That changes year to year. We also have near complete co-location with Aeronet. Uh, that was the goal of the project. Our MPLNet history has involved three version releases, and again, these are similar to Aeronet. Version 1 and 2 span the 2000 to 2021 timeframe. We're currently in version 3, which was released in November 21. Version releases include things like new instrumentation, data products, or data processing capabilities. All the version 2 and 3 data are currently available on our website, and there's a link at the bottom here. The instruments that we deploy must be put inside of an environmentally uh, controlled enclosure, and that's shown on the pictures here. For both the mini MPL and the MPL, the enclosures have an optical quality window on the roof, and we sometimes install this tube on the top to block more of the sunlight and increase our signal to noise. There are controls on the outside for the environment and the temperature and humidity inside, and an Ethernet cable for data communication. We can also use Wi Fi if needed. We're a federated network like Aeronet, which includes both NASA and domestic and international partners. Data are acquired continuously day and night at a one minute temporal resolution and 30 or 75 meter vertical resolution. The raw data are all transmitted back to our central server and automated processing of the data and, um, occurs and the products are available in near real time, which for us is hourly. Our data product suite is shown here. We have four products organized along themes and each of them contain variables and diagnostics. Our NRB product contains the signals. We have a cloud product, aerosol and PBL product and I'll go over each of those in a second. All of our data files are in the standardized format. They're net CDF4, CF compliant and we have full error propagation from raw data to the final variable. All of the error variables are in each of the product as well. The level one and level 1.5 products are available in near real time, and we have QA flags in all of the products. This is our product level table, and again, it's aligned with Aeronet. So we have level one products, all of the data are available in near real time, and there's no QA screen applied. Our level 1.5 products shown in the middle are the same, except we're applying a near real time quality of screen to the data. We're utilizing the NASA GEOS-5 model for all of our meteorological inputs to calculate the molecular quantities. Finally, we have level two data shown here, and these are available after post calibration and for the aerosol product after Aeronet level two data are available. I mentioned we have numerous QA and confidence flags in the data product, and I'll talk more about those during the web tour. Next, I'll discuss each product in more detail. Our NRB product is shown here. The relevant variables are the LIDAR signal, the volume depolarization ratio, the error variables, and the QA flags. The references are shown here. Uh, to the right, I'm showing uh, signal data from NASA Goddard Space Flight Center site on May 28th of this year, and the volume depolarization ratio below. You might notice that there's a very uh, intense layer of depolarizing aerosol in the mid troposphere and i'll come back to that later in the presentation but in addition to the signal and volume depol data we have diagnostics uh, so in green is the laser energy and blue are the temperatures the solar background is in yellow and the purple line here is the surface temperature from the geos 5 model our cloud product is shown here the relevant variables are cloud base and top heights a cloud mask we have hourly and daily cloud fractions, both column and then organized by altitude level, estimates of thin cloud optical depth and extinction, and cloud phase. The uh, reference for the cloud product for the first four bullets up top is shown here. And the left-hand plot demonstrates that we were able to in 
improve our detection capability for thin clouds from version two to the current version three system. The plot shows cloud occurrences versus altitude, and you can see around 10 kilometers, we are improving our cloud detection. Our cloud phase uh, variables are um, shown on this page, and there's a reference at the top for that. Um, the top plot, you see the LiDAR signal as a front is moving through. The middle plot is the volume depolarization ratio, and the bottom is the cloud phase, demonstrating there's ice clouds near the top, transitioning to mixed phase in purple, and then down near the surface, these gray layers are water clouds. On the right is an example of some uh, utilization of the data for science. There's super cool liquid water fractions from MPLNet compared to Calypso. The LiDAR in Calypso is called Calliope. Now, I'll just mention we have many publications examining cirrus clouds with MPLNet and Calypso data. Probably more important for this training um, program, however, is to note that our MPLNet version 3 cloud data were used to validate the new thin Cirrus cloud screen in Aeronet version 3. Next, I'll talk about our aerosol product. The relevant uh, variables are the aerosol top height, or the top of the highest aerosol layer, backscatter and extinction profiles, that LiDAR efficiency parameter, a new term, the LiDAR ratio, I'll talk about in a second, uh, and then various other diagnostic variables. Essentially, our retrievals are the same for aerosol as we had back in version one, uh, but we've added addition of the new lunar AOD data from Aeronet. And of course, then with polarized data, we now have aerosol depolarization ratios. So the first thing we do in the aerosol retrieval is to uh, apply a cloud screen at one minute temper resolution using our cloud product. There's no clouds in the example I'm showing here, but if there were, those minutes would be removed from the signal average. We then apply a running 20 minute signal average to the data, and these cloud screen statistics are kept and used in the QA flags. The next step is to apply our aerosol top height algorithm, and the references are shown here. I don't have time to go into the detail, but our aerosol top height parameter is now shown overlaid on the bottom image. So anywhere above that, we determine there are no aerosol present. Our aerosol property retrievals are discussed on this slide. And for the retrieval of the aerosol properties, we utilize the Aeronet optical depth as a constraint. So if we go back to the LiDAR equation I showed earlier, you'll note that we have the two parameters we want, the particle backscatter and the particle extinction. So we have one equation and two unknowns, and on top of that, it's a transcendental equation. However, solutions are provided by Fernald and Klett. They require the introduction of a new parameter we call the LiDAR ratio, which is uh, below LiDAR ratio is the extinction to backscatter ratio. And it's not just a trick used to solve the equation. The LiDAR ratio is actually inversely proportional to inherent properties of the aerosol, namely the single scatter albedo, which is the absorption of the aerosol, and the phase function at 180 degrees, which is related to the size and shape. So the idea with the solution here is to set an a priori value of the LiDAR ratio. They typically just pick a number of 50 Usually this parameter varies from 20 to 80. Then they replace the extinction in the equation with the LiDAR ratio times backscatter and you solve for backscatter. However, by setting a number for the LiDAR ratio a priori, you can introduce large biases in the retrieval. So for MPLNet, we solve this by constraining the retrieval where we force the extinction to integrate to the Aeronet optical depth. So what we do is first set the LiDAR ratio to a value of say a 100, we solve for the backscatter profile, then we calculate a new value of the LiDAR ratio as shown here. It's the aerosol optical depth from Aeronet divided by the integrated backscatter profile. We repeat this and iterate it until the LiDAR ratio converges. This method does not require a priori specification of the LiDAR ratio, it calculates a column average value in the solution. So an example of this retrieval for one of the Aeronet observations on the day I showed on the last slide is in the corner here. This is the extinction profile. All of the Aeronet data are included in our MPLNet aerosol file. So you have a correlation of the Aeronet and the MPLNet retrievals. They include the optical depth, the angstrom exponent, our calculated LIDAR ratio, of course, the extinction and backscatter, and even the sun photometer or the Aeronet derived LIDAR ratio. 
So on this day, I'm showing in green on the bottom, these are the aerosol optical depths from Aeronet. So every time there's an aerosol optical depth observation, we can do the retrievals I showed before. So now on the top, you have backscatter profiles at the Aeronet times. And on the bottom, these are the LIDAR ratios in orange retrieved from the uh, process. You'll notice that there are gaps in the data where Aeronet has no observations. We can resolve that by using the LIDAR efficiency parameter. We can calculate C by using the Aeronet optical depth as shown below. So if we go to an altitude above the aerosol top where there's no aerosol and there's no clouds, the LIDAR equation simplifies to the form shown here, and we can solve for the system constant. So in purple, these are the retrievals of our system constant shown uh, on the bottom plot. In order to fill in the gaps, we interpolate the C values to our one minute temporal grid shown here. So now we've filled in the day. <clears throat> and these can be used to calculate the column aerosol optical depth at the times without the Aeronet observations. So now we've filled in the aerosol optical depth for the entire day. Now, wherever we have an aerosol optical depth, we can do the aerosol retrievals and fill in the rest of the day with the full backscatter profiles and the LIDAR ratio. So our final aerosol product contains both constrained and interpolated data. The interpolated data will be lower quality. And I mentioned there are a number of QA flags in the product, and, and one of them includes an indication of what type of optical depth was used. Was it day, night, or interpolated? These are the references for our aerosol retrievals. And before I continue, I wanted to mention a caveat. The retrieval shown here assume the LIDAR ratio is constant with altitude. This can bias the results if the LIDAR ratio actually changes. That's a limitation of backscatter LIDAR, and you can solve this by use of a Raman or HSRL LIDAR. So lastly, we have our PBL product. The relevant variables here are the mixed layer height, which is our proxy for the PBL height. And we also have a mixed layer aerosol optical depth, which is the optical depth only in the mixed layer. A reference is shown here. On the right, these are comparisons of the uh, PBL derived from radius on launches with that from our, mi our mixed layer depth and MPL net. On the next slide, I'm showing our uh, LIDAR signal over a two day period. I'm superimposing virtual potential temperature and demonstrating our mixed layer heights. The algorithm actually retrieves three potential heights and down selects to a final. That's shown in red on the plot. So you see that we're able to capture the diurnal evolution of the PBL layer while it's at night, as it grows in the morning, peaks in the afternoon, uh, and then begins to collapse in the evening and for growing again the next day. Here's a 10-year climatology of the mixed layer height and the column Aeronet optical depth and the mixed layer optical depth at Goddard. And if you look at the optical depths, you'll see Aeronet's fairly constant day to night, but you'll see the mixed layer AOD decrease it in the evening and increase into the day as the PBL or the mixed layer grows and entrains more aerosol. You'll notice there's a gap of about 0.05 optical depth. And this indicates that on average, about 0.05 of the Aeronet optical depth is above the boundary layer. So in summary, these are some images of the data that we provide from MPLNet. For a three-day period on the left at Goddard, there's signals on the top. And on the bottom, you see aerosol backscatter, our cloud phase mask, and the mixed layer height in brown. On the right is the volume depolarization measured at our site in Barbados with a Saharan dust layer over the boundary layer. And when you look at the aerosol depolarization ratio below, you can clearly identify the dust layer above the marine boundary layer with weaker depolarization. Summary of products and development is in the appendix. So next, I'll do a tour of the website and demonstrate how you access our data. Topics we'll cover will be project information, network slides, browsing, and downloading data, and using our APIs. This is our MPLNet homepage. Uh, there's a description of the project at the top. There's a random image at the day um, on the bottom, which changes daily. First, I'll start with a discussion of our project material. If you look on the left side, you'll see a menu bar. We go into project and click on version information. This page describes the various versions that we've had up to the one that's currently operating version three. 
If you go back and we click on product information, these are the same product and uh, data level tables that I showed in the presentation. Here we'll click on the aerosol product. All of these pages bring you to a description of the product and some references. At the bottom, there's a table which contains all of the information in our, in our uh, product files. We have the variable, the definition, type, units, and if there's a CF standard name. Uh, we also have the global variables, variables described in here as well. There are also buttons to click on QA flags and QA criteria. Uh, so if I click on QA flags and I'll scroll down, you'll see flag AOD. For the aerosol product, this is the QA flag I mentioned that tells you whether or not the data were from sun photometer or aeronet optical depth, lunar optical depth, or LIDAR derived. That would be the interpolation. So if you want more information on our products, they're available on this product information page. Uh, next, you'll see a formats link here. If you click this, this will present an NC dump style representation of our data file, if you're more familiar with that. It's also useful if you want to see what our uh, each variable's attributes look like and what they are. Next, I'll discuss uh, looking for sites and our data. So if you go into the data section and we click browse V3 data, a map will appear with our sites. You can, of course, navigate around the map. You can also click on um, any of the icons and a quick look image will appear of the LiDAR signal with links to the site page. All of the other inf information is displayed in tables below. We have, they're organized by the active sites. Oops, sorry. And then the inactive sites below. The first column contains the site name with links to the site page. We have lat lawns. If you click these, they bring you to Google map to view the site. Uh, the Aeronet site name is shown in this column. And if you click on that, it brings you to the Aeronet Synergy tool. For now, I'll click on the Goddard Space Flight Center site. There's some metadata information at the top and then a calendar view below of where and when we have data. For Goddard, this goes back to 2001. Anywhere you see a link, we have data. Um, for instance, if you look into the future, say October, November, uh, there are no links available. So you can click on any one of these and go to the data browse page, but you can also click on the month headers. And here you'll get a month view with quick looks. These are helpful if you're looking for a particular event or some sort of atmospheric uh, structure of interest. You can click on any one of these and also go to the site or to the data browse page. For now, I'll go back to the calendar view and we'll select May 28th of this year. This will bring up our browse page. So on the top will be the LiDAR signal, the volume depolarization ratio. And if you notice, I'm using the same day that I showed for the NRB product example before with this depolarizing layer overhead. The next plot window is an overlay of the aerosol backscatter. Our cloud phase, you can see some clouds, uh, water clouds here, and then in brown, the mixed layer height. And on the bottom are some diagnostic plots. You'll notice each plot window has various plotting controls below, so you can control the plot and dynamically change various parameters. Um, you can also change variables you'd like to plot. If you look at the top, we have controls to change the start and end date of the plot, as well as the altitude. So I'll demonstrate that by changing the start time. We'll go back one day to May 27th and forward one day to May 29th, and we'll change the altitude range from zero to 15 kilometers. Now, if you hit any plot button in any of the windows, it will replot all of the data. So now we're seeing three days of data from zero to 15 kilometers. In addition, you can add variables to plot. If you look down below each window, there's a green cross if we hit that. Now you can select any level and product that you would like to plot. Here I'll select level one PBL. I'll choose the mixed layer top variable and hit plot and it will overlay it on the image. If you notice for each of these, there's a line plot button as well. So if I click that for the aerosol product, it brings you to a line plot display. And in this case, it will show you the backscatter. So there's various ways to look at our data dynamically on the website. For accessing our data files, you click download data 
uh, here under the data section of the menu. And before I begin, I'll mention our data policy, which is also on the side menu. We ask that you adhere to this before use of any of the data. It is openly available, as you'll see in a second. We have two ways to access the data here. One is the data portal. If you click this in version three, there's an FTP style portal to access the data so you can manually download it. We also have a data ordering tool below. And here I'll select the data we were just looking at. So I'll go down to our Goddard site. I'll pick May 27th as the start. And May 28th as the end date, or sorry, May 29th as the end date. I'll select the level one aerosol product and then hit search. So here it will tell you that three data files were found and you can click the download button here, agree to our data policy in the pop-up window, and it will compile the files you requested into a zip and download to your hard drive. You can also select to remove the QA variables flags or subset any of the variables to make the files smaller. Next, I'll move on to our APIs. Those are available under web services. We have uh, APIs to download the data plot and look at metadata. So if you click on download, it will describe how to download the files with our API. That's our third method of accessing our data. If you click on plot, this describes our plotting API. Uh, and as an example uh, shown here, if you want to produce dynamically an image with our aerosol backscatter, the cloud phase, and the mixed layer height. Uh, here's the URL string example. So if you click this, you'll notice it will just return that image, not the entire website. Lastly, we have a metadata API where you can download CSV, KML, or JSON formats that are in a Galleon standard. And I'll talk about Galleon as another project at the end of the presentation. As an example, if you'd like to get all of the active sites in a CSV file, there's an example link here. If you click this, you'll see you get the site name, site coordinates information, status, and then a link to the site page in the CSV file. If you wanted uh, more information, you could use our standard Galleon JSON format. So if we wanna look at Goddard site on October 1st, 23, here's an example. I'll click this and it returns a JSON with some header information at the top, then a station element with all of the station metadata, a contact element with all of the PI, science, and technical contacts, the date, and then a data list of all the variables available. In this case, this is our signal. So it has units, uh, it has hours of the day, it tells you which hour of the day has data and the status, the data level, instrumentation, etc. More importantly, in the metadata file are links to the browse page, and links to the data file itself. So you'll see the link here if you click this, that will actually begin to download the data file for that day to your hard drive. So in this JSON format has everything you need to access uh, state site information as well as access the data. And that concludes the web tour. Next, I'll discuss some case studies using MPLNet data. MPLNet has contributed to many research projects, journal publications, presentations, et cetera. I'll only show a few examples here. Um, MPLNet has had a global impact on aerosol cloud and PBL research as shown in this web of science citation map back from 2022. We've also contributed to unforeseen research projects, including the ice cube neutrino study in Antarctica. Here I'll focus on some aerosol related examples relevant to this training. I'll start with smoke, which is becoming uh, increasingly important. We've contributed to a lot of wildfire smoke research, and I'm showing a listing of various publications here, uh, organized by Southeast Asia, uh, North American and European smoke, studies of volcanic plumes, and then a series of papers actually examining both. And we have more of these in press right now. I wanna highlight the paper by Osborne et al., where they were looking at uh, the impact of Rikoki volcano eruption in 2019 on flight operations over the UK. The UK Met Office began seeing high altitude plumes appear about one week before they forecast the arrival of the volcanic ash. 
This ended up being smoke coming from fires burning in Alberta that began a week prior. So this paper discusses that, but what I wanted to highlight is that uh, large fires are becoming increasingly prevalent and we're having smoke blanketing the Northern Hemisphere for most of the year. And right now, a lot of the larger fires are dumping smoke into the atmosphere at same altitudes that we typically see with volcanic eruptions. So we're getting an incredibly complex environment for most of the year. I can illustrate that with this next slide that I call the wall of smoke example from our MPL net measurements at Goddard back in June of last year. You see some heavy layers here present. Um, and through analysis, we can identify the lower altitude plumes, the ones that actually eventually reached the surface with smoke from Eastern Canada, namely Quebec. So this was the smoke that blanketed much of the Eastern US uh, that time of year and generated a lot of news stories. In mid uh, troposphere between five to 10 kilometers, these plumes are from Western Canadian fires in Alberta. And this layer up high above 10 kilometers is actually smoke from older fires after circumnavigating the globe. So it's important to consider even one fire can produce a complicated environment based on its life cycle, um, how long it's burning. Um, it will produce different smoke properties and varied layer heights. If you add in multiple fires with different fuel types, uh, the complication increases. And I can illustrate that by looking at the volume depolarization on this day, where you'll notice that the lower plumes coming from Eastern Canada have lower depolarization, which indicates the particles were more spherical. This could be due to something with the smoke shape, or it could also be due to more sulfate being transported with the plume than those from Western Canada. So the point I'm making here is using remotely sensed data, especially passive observations, must be done carefully to avoid misinterpreting what you're looking at, especially with satellite data. And these conditions are becoming more prevalent for most of the year. Another smoke study is shown here. These were Quebec fires back in 2002. Um, in this case, the authors were able to use the signals measured over Goddard and look at the plume heights as they ar arrived and do back trajectories to follow the smoke back over the source of the fire and determine the injection heights over the fire. They then validated and compared them to what was being used in the model. Next, I'll discuss some satellite support. Uh, this this um, slide focuses on the Calypso mission, which has a LIDAR on board called Calliope. We've been supporting their version three product development. This will be the final release for this mission, which unfortunately has ended already. Namely, we're providing LIDAR ratios from undersampled regions. And this is part of a project joint with MERA, shown here on the left. If you're interested in MERA, you can visit the website. The version five aerosol product from Calypso will be quite different over the ocean, where they're actually using LIDAR ratios measured from the instrument. Uh, and MPLNet and some other projects, projects are also providing our information to help them generate a more accurate aerosol product over the ocean. We're also supporting the, an ESA mission called EarthCare that recently launched. ESA EarthCare mission includes ATLID, which is the next satellite LIDAR. It's in commissioning phase now. Data will be available soon. ATLID's a polarized high spectral resolution LIDAR operating at 355. We're a member of the validation team, and some of our tasks are shown on the left. We're validating the aerosol cloud and boundary layer heights. Uh, we're also comparing their precipitation product with one of our own that is in development. And we're doing some joint analysis of cirrus cloud forcing using MPLNet and EarthCare data. The pictures shown here are demonstration of using the Calliope data as a proxy for EarthCare to look at cloud fraction and occurrence, aerosol heights, and the PBL height. Other case studies are available in the appendix. So I'll conclude with a discussion of accessing global LIDAR data. And here I'll discuss a project called Galleon. Galleon's a network of LIDAR networks organized through the WMO Global Atmospheric Watch Program. Myself and Lucia Mona are the co-chairs. We have guidance and direction provided by a steering committee of our fellow network heads in the table shown at the bottom as well as the GAW Aerosol Science Advisory Group. We have a report that was published in, in 2008. The um, 
Galleon LiDAR networks that compose Galleon at the moment are listed here with the red dots, and all of them have signed agreements with WMO's contributing networks. More information and links about each of the Galleon networks uh, is available on our website. There's a link here. The idea for Galleon is to generate global coverage closer to the scale of Aeronet that you get with the passive measurements. We recognize the only way to do this is by working together and combining our networks into one network of LiDAR networks. Our website is shown here. Um, we provide information on Galleon as well as a search and discovery tool I'll show in a second. We also have automated handshakes with the WMO OSCAR database, which contains all of the WMO ground-based observations and traceability back to the observational requirements. So the goal is to provide one source for you to visit to get aggregated LiDAR network information and data. I should mention we're still updating the metadata from some of the networks. So the website is functional, but some portions of it are not available to the public yet. This is our search tool. If you visit the website and click on sites, here we display all of the networks um, and you get a now a co more complete picture of the global LIDAR network data and the distribution of our sites. These are color coded by each individual network. There's a table at the bottom, which will contain links to the network for each site. Uh, we also um, composite sites together if they're co-located. We have links to the site page for each of them status, and then metadata information on the location. The final columns are the WMO site name and its YGOS ID, if it has one, and then a listing of the other networks um, and, pro and programs that are co-located at the site. All of the search features, including uh, some of them at the top here, where you can search for uh, sites by variable or those that only have data in the PBL or the stratosphere, for instance, all of those search features are also available via API. I'll discuss some tools in development. These are not available to the public yet, but they will soon be. We'll have metadata downloads, and that is in that Galleon JSON format I mentioned previously, which does contain links to the browse images and directly to the data files. We also have a tool which can analyze trajectories. These will extract sites along the track, and those are available for high split files, KML or CSV, or volcanic ash advisories, either in the simple text or XML format. So here I'll show a high split example, and I'll go back to that day I showed and ask that, what was that aerosol layer over Goddard on May 28th? I'm showing it here again for reference. It's highly depolarizing, and it looks like it may be dust, but it's very late in the season to have Asian dust transport to the US. So I'll utilize our high split tool to determine this. Uh, so when we go live with the enhanced tool, there'll be a section to upload a trajectory file. In this case, I select high split. And in the bottom, you see the tool will extract all of the galleon stations along each air mass trajectory. They're color coded and grouped together by trajectory. I'll use this information on the next slide uh, to determine what this layer is over Goddard. So here, if we look at the map of the extracted galleon stations, you'll see that we have data starting on May 28th at Goddard. And then two days earlier, we have data available from the Reno MPLNet site. But if we constrain ourselves only to MPLNet data, the next data point we have is eight days earlier at our site uh, in Israel in the Middle East. Using Galleon, we have access to more LIDAR stations and more data, including the Sapporo station in ADNET, which is the uh, Eastern Asian LiDAR network, and then two sites in early net, which is the European LiDAR network. So here again is the data shown at Goddard, and now I access the quick look data through the Galleon search tool for these stations. And we'll see here at the Reno station two days earlier, they are also capturing this elevated plume. And if we go in temporal order here, we look at the quick look available from, uh, uh, from the ADNET network, and their quick looks a bit different. They have the LiDAR signal at the top, depolarization ratio in the middle. And then because they use two wavelength LiDARs, they're able to take a ratio of the backscatter and produce a parameter which is similar to the angstrom exponent with Aeronet. It looks at the size. So when the air mass went over the Sapporo station, unfortunately, it was at the end of May 23rd into May 24th, and there was a rain event. But immediately preceding that, there is evidence of aerosol reaching deeper into the troposphere. 
it's depolarizing and they indicate large particles. So in the Sapporo site, we're also seeing indication of this layer. If we look at our MIMPL net site in, in the Middle East or the early net stations uh, in the Middle East and in the Mediterranean, there's no evidence of this layer. So we can conclude that the source of this must be somewhere between those stations, perhaps over northern China or Mongolia. And I'll note that one of the trajectories, the lower altitude one, actually stalls out for a bit in this region. So now if we move to NASA Worldview tool, we're able to look at satellite data and incorporate MODIS fires in the VIRS deep blue aerosol type. We'll notice that there is evidence of a storm system moving through on May 23rd. Yeah, even some indication of dust above the cloud layer here that indicating that it is at the same or similar altitude we're seeing in the LIDAR data. The aerosol types indicate dust, some fire, and then some mixtures as well in this area. And there are some fires burning in, in Siberia during this period. So combining this together, based on the multiple galleon networks and the NASA satellite data, we can conclude that this layer of dust originated over Mongolia somewhere around May 23rd and was likely mixed with smoke from fires in Siberia. So I just wanted to present an example of doing analysis or your research incorporating more LIDAR data than just what's available from MPLNet. So thank you for your interest in the NASA MPLNet project. And Carl, I'll hand it over to you. So thank you very much, Judd, for that uh, excellent overview of the MPLNet system. And now I'm going to just close us out with summarizing the overall training on our NASA Atmospheric Composition Ground Networks, which support air quality and climate applications. Over the course of the five sessions of this training, we've covered four different NASA networks, the AeroNet network, looking at aerosols, Pandora and the Pandonia Global Network, which is another passive remote sensing instrument, this time looking at trace gases, the Tropospheric Ozone LiDAR Network, or TOLNET, an active remote sensor looking at ozone in the troposphere. And finally, the Micropulse LiDAR Network, or MPLNet, which we learned about today, which gives information and atmospheric profiles of aerosols and clouds, including aerosol properties and the planetary boundary layer height. So between all these networks, there's a wide variety of different types of information that these networks offer on different properties of the atmospheric composition and structure. The networks have various sizes, and many of these networks also work in close uh, cooperation or federation with other international groups and efforts. For example, today we learned about the Galleon Network, which MPLNet is part of. And together, these give us really a, a global scope in our ability to observe uh, the atmosphere and collect this information. And this information uh, from all these networks, together with information from satellites and atmospheric models, really allows us to study various different aspects of the atmosphere, including aspects relevant for air quality and relevant for the Earth's climate in a wide variety of different areas and in a wide variety of different ways. So hopefully throughout this training, you've learned a little bit about what each of these networks offer and how the data from these networks can be used together with information from other sources to address questions that are relevant to you and your work. At the end of today's session, we'll be posting to the training webpage a homework assignment. This assignment is accessible as a Google form. You can submit your answers uh, in that Google form. The homework assignment will be due in two weeks on September 5th. And to receive a certificate from completion of the course, you do have to complete that homework assignment before that deadline of September 5th. And in addition, you will have had to attend all five of the live webinars that we've offered as part of this training series. Uh, if you complete all those requirements, you should receive a certificate via email uh, about two months after the completion of the course. Here is our contact information for myself and Dr. Welton, together with information about uh, RSET and some of our sister programs if you have further questions. And here's a summary of some of the resources we provided, not only on Aeronet, but on all the other networks we've presented over the course of this training. And now we'll move on to the question and answer session.
All right, so we've had um, quite a few questions and we'll try our best to answer them uh, live during this session. Again, any questions we don't get to live will be answered in this document, which will be posted to the training website uh, in about a week. So to start us off um, with questions one and two, we had a couple questions at the beginning about the depolarization ratio, how it's calculated and what it can be used for. So um, if you want to provide a general answer to, to those questions. Okay, thanks, Carl. Um, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Yeah, the, uh, I know I was covering quite a bit of detail in this presentation. The depolarization ratio is one of the more difficult concepts to communicate. So I understand why there were several questions on that. Um, the depolarization ratio is a measurement of the two polarized states that the LIDAR emits into the atmosphere. It's typically what we call a co-polarized and a cross-polarized state that are emitted into the atmosphere. Most LIDARs use, use linear um, polarization. So there's a co, you know, a parallel or a perpendicular laser state emitted. And then they take a ratio of the returns at those two orientation states, and that is the depolarization ratio. The micropulse slide are designed a bit more complicated as it's a transceiver. Uh, so we're using a mixture of linear and elliptical light. But the idea is the same. We take a, a ratio of the signal returns from those two emitted states, and that's the depolarization ratio. Um, it requires calibration to be accurate, but the ratio is really a measure of the particle sphericity. So if you have a lower depolarization ratio at a particular altitude, that means there's more spherical particles. You have a higher ratio that indicates the presence of non-spherical particles. Okay, great. Um, and again, I think you noted this for several things, but there are more details that are provided in an appendix to your presentation. And that's been uploaded to the training web page. So if people have uh, questions, uh, there are some more technical details provided in that uh, in those slides. So question three, how many MPL net stations are at or co-located with the Aeronet stations? Yeah, the uh, both of our networks change, uh, you know, the network size is in flux year to year. So I don't have an exact number, but probably about 98% or more. Of NPLNet is co-located with Aeronet. Um, really, the only places where we are not are at extreme polar latitudes, like our site at the South Pole. Uh, we had another one um, in Svalbard. Uh, and uh, I think all of the, the few research cruise deployments we've done uh, have also been co-located with Aeronet, just not with the CMOL. It's been using their handheld sun photometer and the MAN network. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, so questions four and five, uh, you did cover them during the presentation. They were asked a, a little bit early uh, during the, the during the presentation. So we would refer people back to the presentation. And again, we'll be posting uh, the recording of this training um, in the next few days uh, to the training webpage. Uh, so I think we'll go to question six next. Um, does the molecular attenuated backscatter signal vary uh, day to day? Yes, it can vary day to day and based on location. Uh, the molecular scattering is dependent on the meteorology, so the pressure really. Um, so we use the NASA GEOS 5 model to get our meteorological information at all of the stations. And then from that, we calculate the molecular scattering. Okay. Um, question seven was two uh, different questions, actually. The first was basically what makes MPL I safe? And then second, what is the uh, sampling frequency, I think, was the question of the of the system. Yes, uh, the the question included the optical depth, um, mm -hmm. optical yeah. depth in the atmosphere, and the eye safety of the instrument aren't really the same thing. Uh, but the MPL was the really the first visible lidar um, operating a visible wavelength that was designed to be eye safe, and you achieve that by using very low energy pulses. Typically, we're about six microjoules per pulse. And then we also expand that beam um, through the transceiver to the full diameter of the instrument. So it expands to almost 20 uh, centimeters in diameter. So the energy density is very low anywhere in the beam. Um, and the only way we get good signal to noise uh, addresses the second part of the question. And, and yes, it was 
we, we do that by using a high repetition rate laser, in, in our case, 2,500 hertz. Okay, thank you. Um, so question eight, how do you distinguish between the depolarization from non-sphericity versus multiple scattering? Yeah, this uh, this question really could be applied to but to other aspects of what we're measuring, not just depolarization. Uh, but the uh, well, as a result of being a, a, an iSafe design, the MPL and the mini MPL use very narrow fields of view on our receiver, and we do that to reduce the solar background noise. Uh, so typically, we're about a hundred microradian field of view, which is much narrower than a typical lidar system. Um, so since we have a narrow field of view, this really removes a lot of the multiple scattering problems that you encounter with other designs. Uh, if we are, you know, if we're looking at a very thick layer, uh, it's possible we could begin to see some multiple scattering, but we also tend to attenuate very quickly in those layers, um, really probably before we begin to detect any multiple scattering impact. Okay. Um, so question nine is how does the polarization induced in the, the instrument, um, and do you measure both parallel and perpendicular polarization? I think you discussed this a little bit when discussing the depolarization ratio, but if you have anything uh, to add here. Yeah, I think this is a similar question. Mm -hmm. uh, I was answering them rather quickly, but uh, I don't know if I have much more to add. Um, the uh, Yeah, really get, getting too much into the detail here was beyond the scope of mm -hmm. this presentation. So I, I can point you to our website where we have more information on this, as well as links to other papers. The, the polarization design for the NPL was actually developed by colleagues of ours in the DOE ARM program. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a paper they have out on that if you want to look at the original um, design. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Um, okay, so question 10, uh, how do you maintain all the time beam alignments for both TX and RX? Yeah, the, um, I guess I, maybe I misinterpreted this a bit, but, uh, well, I can address what I wrote and then uh, I'll mm -hmm. add a bit more. Um, the, uh, in terms of timing, the NPL data system controls the timing between the emission of the laser pulse and then reception of the signal. We use a photon counting detector for that. We do a small range correction during the calibration process. Um, but if they were talking about the alignment of the transmitted and received signal, uh, then the NPL is a transceiver design. So we're biaxial and we, we don't have this type of problem. So there's uh, there's no real bore site required with an MPL uh, but that's handled during the construction and initial alignment and calibration of the instrument itself. Okay. Um, so question 11 deals with maybe plans to expand MPL net to Ethiopia, and maybe we can uh, expand this question. There were several questions related to basically how do I join the MPL net? How do I purchase the instruments and so forth? So maybe you could just uh, address those here. Sure. Yeah, I, I, this is probably one of my number one questions I get a lot. Um, mm -hmm. So specific to Ethiopia, uh, unfortunately, no, at this time, there aren't plans to deploy something. Um, in general, we, we really can't grow as large as Aeronet because we're using a LIDAR and the LIDAR cost and complexity is just much greater than the sun photometer. Mm -hmm. So it's an inherent limit based on budget and, you know, uh, our staff size to handle all of that. Um, so we're a little bit more constrained in what we can deploy. We do have a list that we maintain of planned deployments that is dependent on funding, but also availability. Much like Aeronet, we're using a commercial instrument. So if you purchase one yourself and are interested in joining the network, that does make it easier for us to discuss incorporating you into MPLNet. Um, so if you're interested in buying one, I'd recommend that you contact the company. Um, at the moment, our list of planned stations is still uh, includes sites we had planned during COVID. Uh, mm -hmm. So once we clear that list, which should happen at the end of this year, we'll probably be more open to looking at other stations. Okay, great. Um, so question 10, can we measure stratospheric aerosol with MPLNet? Uh, yes, the answer is yes. Um, if you want to retrieve properties of aerosol in the stratosphere, we would have to do much longer time averaging. 
we don't actually have any stratospheric aerosol product, uh, but we can do um, some custom analysis where needed. However, in terms of just detecting the stratospheric aerosol layers, that is that is uh, quite easy, especially at night with the MPL. Um, our signal data is acquired up to 30 kilometers. I think most recently we looked at the Ruang eruption in Indonesia, and we detect that over Singapore site at about a, a 22 to 23 kilometer altitude, I believe. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, question 13, um, are MPL net vertical profiles all zenith measurements? And does it have a different footprint uh, or spatial representation, I guess, with respect to Aeronet, since Aeronet uh, does direct sun scans typically? Yes, the, uh, the answer to, to all of that is yes. Um, MPLNet data are all, they're essentially nadir. We're looking straight up. We have a small angle tilt to avoid any specular reflection from ice clouds. But in terms of this question, we're basically pointed straight up. Mm -hmm. The internet instruments looking at the sun and then, of course, doing sky scans for radiance. Mm -hmm. So we do have different view angles. Uh, the MPL can be scanned uh, with some additional equipment. We do not do that for MPLNet operations. Okay. Um, question 14, uh, is the aerosol extinction calculated using the classical Klett inversion technique and what was the LIDAR ratio used? I think you also, you know, covered this in the presentation to some extent, but if you want to add any uh, details here. Yeah, I, I think this question came a little before that slide. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, we, we use a Fernald Klett uh, inversion technique, but we use the Aeronet optical depth as a constraint. So we don't so we don't specify or set the LIDAR ratio. We actually calculate the column average value. Mm -hmm. OK, um, so the next question was about how to download the MPL net net data. Again, I, you covered this in the presentation a little bit uh, later after the question was asked, but it the data are available through the MPL net website. Yes, um, the, the yeah. one thing I, I may add is uh, mm -hmm. there, there may be some data we have not finished reprocessing in version 3 yet. Um, that data would be available in our version 2 archive, but if you're interested or need some data in version 3 that are not avail available, you can contact me. Okay. Um, question 16 was another question related to basically how to join the network. Um, I think the only thing different here was questions about some other instruments, but MPL only MPL net rather only supports the MPL net uh, instruments. Um, so let's go to question 17. Um, how is the range corrected backscatter signal normalized? And with what value the normaliza is the normalization done for the range corrected backscatter signal? Yeah, this was discussed in uh, in the slides a bit. I have more on this in the appendix. Mm -hmm. um, the our, our what we call our NRB signal, uh, uh, the normalization part of the name re refers to the fact that we normalize the measured signal to the range to the range squared to remove the the range square fall off you get from scattering, and then we also normalize it to the emitted laser energy. Um, and uh, so that produces our signal, the attenuated backscatter signal, which you typically you might be used to from Calypso. Uh, that involves removal of this lighter efficiency parameter or the lighter constant. We do not provide attenuated backscatter from MPL net because it's more difficult to do that from the ground. We do have that, that uh, variable in our aerosol product, so you could use that to then calculate attenuated backscatter from our signal product if you wanted. Okay. Um, question 18, do we need to perform any background corrections? Uh, well, I, I interpret this as you, the user, and the mm -hmm. answer is no. Yeah. Uh, as MPLNet, we provide all of the calibration and data processing. Yeah. All right, so question 19, uh, I think there were a few questions about uh, the interactions between MPLNet and Calypso. You discussed this to some extent in your presentation, but... Um, uh, maybe you could just discuss a little bit more based on your, your the answer here, um, the synergies between MPLNet and Calypso. Sure. Uh, yeah, there there have been some studies and publications. Um, as you, the, the word you used is a synergy is probably the better term. Um, 
there have been several, most of them have been cloud related. However, I'll mention that it is really difficult to do a direct comparison mm -hmm. between Calypso uh, or satellite LIDAR, um, for instance, now Earth Care is in orbit. It's very hard to do that direct comparison between satellite LIDAR and a fixed ground station LIDAR because the swath of each instrument is so narrow. Mm -hmm. um, and you know the, the satellite's moving quickly. So it's really better to think of a synergy. We are combining the data from both and the satellite LIDAR provides a lot of spatial coverage, not much temporal information, especially from low earth orbit, but the ground stations don't have much spatial information, but we have a lot of temporal information, especially in MPLNet because we're operating 24 seven. Okay. Um, so question 20, uh, will the C values eventually be used for completing uh, Aeronet level two data in order to avoid problems of not being able to measure when clouds are present? And could this C factor be used to complete the data when the, there are technical problems in the instrument? Yeah, so our, our level two MPLNet aerosol processing is the, the same as I described in the presentation. The only difference is that we would use level two Aeronet optical depth as our constraint for level one and 1.5 processing, we're using level 1.5 Aeronet AOD. Mm -hmm. um, that's really the only difference. We do use the C values to track the health of the instrument along with the instrument diagnostics. And then of course, to produce what we call our interpolated aerosol retrievals. Mm -hmm. uh, but just like in, in level 1.5 data, those would be, they would, they would be level two data, but they would be marked as less confident in our confidence flag. Mm -hmm. Okay, so question 21, well, what is the agreement between the PBLs from MPLNet and from Radiosons? Yeah, again, I, it was discussed briefly on the PBL product. Um, the original, our original PBL product, or, or really mixed layer height, I should say, not PBL height, but a mixed layer height variable, uh, was discussed in the paper reference that I provided on that slide. And as part of that study, there was a comparison of our retrievals to the PBL height from radius on data. Mm -hmm. um, there have been some some other uh, work such uh, like that, but a, a really large scale, you know, comparison between our MPL net mixed layer heights and radius on PBL heights has not been done. But I'd, I'd love to see that. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, question twenty two: How is cloud screening done for MPL net? signals yes the uh so our, our data are all on a one minute um temporal resolution for the aerosol product we do a 20 minute signal average so any minute of data that contains a cloud base in our cloud product that is below the aerosol top height is screened from that 20 minute average um, if a cloud is detected above the aerosol top then the signal is left in the average but that is flagged in our product. Um, you know, ideally, Aeronet data should be cloud free, but we do typically see the presence of clouds, especially thin cirrus above the aerosol layer, uh, even though Aeronet has data. And this could be due to the different view angles, as we discussed earlier, uh, or the potential of just missing, uh, missing that cloud in the Aeronet processing. So we do flag that in our data. Uh, and that was part of what was used to to help in the development of the version three Aeronet data using our cloud product and the detection of these missed clouds in the aerosol product. Okay. Um, question twenty three: What are the differences between the mini MPL and the CL fifty one and sixty one salometers? Yes, I was waiting for that question. Um, mm -hmm. The differences are shrinking over time. Uh, but typically, the MPL is still classed in the, the LIDAR category, not really a salometer. Um, that's mostly because we're using a green wavelength in our case versus a near-infrared wavelength that's in most salometers. Mm -hmm. um, as a result, we just have a better signal-to-noise ratio than you typically see with salometers and also a longer range. We, you know, we, we do profile up to 30 kilometers. Most salometers are capped much, at much lower altitudes. Uh, the MPL is also polarized, and until the recent release of the CL61, that was not available in salometers. 
Um, so we are um, looking at intercomparisons now and more planned between the mini MPL and the CL61. Okay. Um, question 24 is another question about basically, you know, how to expand or grow the network. I think you've already addressed that uh, previously. So let's go to question 25. Um, can we discriminate between the aerosol types? And I guess the question is basically, which is more accurate in, between the Calypso and I guess the MPL LIDAR? Sure. Um, so I'll say it is definitely more difficult to discriminate aerosol types with just MPL net. Uh, we really have only one wavelength, which limits what we can do. Calypso has two wavelengths, uh, 532 and 1064 in the near IR. So they're able to get some information about particle size, uh, as we both have polarization measurements. So if you add the extra wavelength, Calypso can do a little bit more because they have information on particle size. But really, if you want to talk about aerosol types or, or aerosol properties, which are really what you, you use when you're looking at the type, it's better to use multi-wavelength Raman or HSRL instruments to do that. Um, for MPLNet, we can infer dust or smoke versus other aerosol types, but that's pretty much the limit. Okay. Um, question 26 is another question about basically joining the network. What's the cost of a mini MPL? And that's provided. Uh, we recommend you go to the company's website to look that up uh, or contact them. Um, so question 27, um, basically, should the Aeronet AOD data be available from the, for the same sites as the MPL net? Another question related to co-location. And then what maybe is the maximum distance between the sites? Yes. Um, so we, we do require co-location with Aeronet, as I said before, except in, you know, situations where it's just, it's not appropriate, like our extreme sites where it's snows most of the year, it's too cold for the seamal. Um, and in terms of the co-location, we limit the distance between MPLNet and Aeronet to less than one kilometer, uh, ideally much closer, especially if you're in a region with a lot of local aerosol sources. Um, uh, and I, I, again, I would mention there have been some early deployments in the network where we uh, did not use Aeronet optical depth. Uh, and those, I think, were some early research cruises that predated MAN the man portion of Aeronet. But uh, for now, we require co-location with Aeronet. Okay. Um, so questions 28 and 29 were both uh, quite expansive questions. I don't know if you wanna try to take some time to answer these now, or we can uh, come back afterwards and maybe point to some papers or, or references for these. Sure, I, I can. Uh, I can give a bit of a. Well, I'll, I'll do my best with question twenty-eight. Um, okay. Uh, I guess I'll say that the. Uh, I guess they're kind of asking what are typical depolarization ratios for, say, mm -hmm. ice, water clouds, and aerosols. So, water clouds will have very low depolarization. Ice clouds will will have very high, typically thirty or to forty percent in in that range. Um, aerosol depolarization ratios can vary pretty wildly. Uh, spherical particles such as sulfate and marine aerosols like sea salt, which tend to be more, more spherical uh, unless they begin drying, have very low depolarization also. Dust uh, has much higher depolarization. Um, so if it's a thick dust layer, that is typically in the 30% range somewhere there. Um, if you're looking at the volume depolarization for dust, it can be lower. As I tried to explain in the presentation, the volume depolarization is not the same as the particle depolarization. Mm -hmm. The uh, volume depolarization ratio is a ratio of our signals. The aerosol depolarization is a retrieved product, so it's more accurate. Um, and smoke, smoke depolarization can vary pretty wildly. Uh, depends on the size and the age um, and the, of the smoke particles, but they typically may be in the uh, 15 to 25% range in depolarization. These are all kind of vague numbers. That's why I didn't want to give mm. anything specific. Uh, in terms of backscatter and extinction parameters for NPLNet, those are really not what we would use to 
explain to someone whether this was an ice or a water cloud, that would be more of just the depolarization. But if you want to begin looking at, at aerosol typing, which is I think what this meant, again, that can be very difficult with MPL net because we're using a more simple LIDAR. If you have multi-wavelength Raman or HSRL, you have more accurate backscatter and extinction profiles and at different wavelengths, you can begin to do retrievals of the properties like the index of refraction, look at the absorption, uh, things like that, that help you differentiate aerosol species. Okay, great. Um, and then question 29, uh, I guess similar, I don't know if you wanna address this a little bit now, but I guess the question's basically how to distinguish between aerosols either in the boundary layer or outside of it. Uh, it's pretty broad, but I guess if you wanna provide some information. Sure, the, um, so the, our, our aerosol product provides an aerosol extinction profile and our PBL product uh, has the mixed layer height. So we can take our retrieved aerosol extinction profile and integrate that from the surface to the mixed layer height. And that then is the aerosol optical depth in the mixed layer. So that's different than the aeronet optical depth that you're getting, which is the column. So that's the all of the aerosol optical depth in the entire atmospheric column. Um, so the mixed layer optical depth will always be less than the Aronet AOD. And mm -hmm. I believe they're referring to the slide I showed on our uh, our new products we're developing, our level three products where we're looking at climatologies. Mm -hmm. And for the Goddard Space Flight Center, uh, sorry, for our, our site at Goddard, um, over a 10 year period, there was a difference of about 0.05 aerosol optical depth at midday, the height of the mixed layer. Um, compared to that of Aeronet. So that indicates that on average at, at that particular site, there's about 0.05 optical depth in the free troposphere or mm -hmm. also stratosphere, not at the surface. Mm -hmm. So you, if you have lighter profiles of aerosol extinction and an idea of the PBL height or the mixed layer height, you can determine what the amount of optical depth that's in the boundary layer. I hope, hope I answered that question. Yeah, I think that that's a good answer there. Um, okay, so question 30, um, is the AOD at the MPL uh, wavelength obtained from simple interpolation of Aeronet AOD? Yeah, I'm not sure what uh, simple, if this is considered simple, but we use the yeah. a kind of a standard two-order polynomial fit to the Aeronet optical depths across their wavelengths. That's how yeah. we then get the optical depth at 532. Okay. Um, okay, question 31, has MPL net been used for large scale aerosol transport, I guess, specifically for volcanic eruptions? Yes, it has. There's a number of publications uh, and studies people have done. You can see, look on our, our publication page on the website. Um, some I listed, uh, I believe in the uh, case studies section. Interestingly, it's uh, sort of morphing into combined studies of volcanic eruptions and, and large fire and smoke events. Um, but there are even a few more in, in process now. Um, I think people are still, they're still looking at the Rikoki eruption at this point mm -hmm. with our data. But I will mention that it's, you know, the studies are being done not just with MPLNet, but data from the other LiDAR networks that are in Galleon, because together we get a, a denser coverage globally. Mm -hmm. And then I guess related to that question 32, again, asks about expanding the network, but with specific uh, reference to South America. So if you want to talk a little bit about the, the, the networks there. Sure. Um, the, so, uh, you know, with, with, with some budget constraints with MPLNet, my focus for expanding the network has been to fill in the gaps between my colleagues and the other LiDAR networks, most of whom are regional, such as EarlyNet in Europe, uh, AdNet or ADNet in Eastern Asia, and LollyNet, who are in South America or really Latin America. Um, they're, they're really working regionally to get a denser LiDAR coverage. So most of where I expand MPLNet are into regions where there is no LiDAR coverage. Um, so when it comes to LollyNet, I've been collaborating with them. We have we do have one site that's joint with LollyNet. Um, we are talking about some more MPLNet deployments into the region. 
but if you're interested in that uh, or in that region in particular, I would recommend that you contact my LollyNet colleagues, and there's a link on our Galleon website um, to go to the LollyNet page. Okay, great. Um, so question 33 is specifically about the effectiveness in detecting Saharan sandstorms and their characteristics. Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I can say the MPLNet instruments are, are very um, capable of detecting the presence of dust compared to other aerosol types. Uh, and that's not just in regions near the Sahara in this case, but even far downwind and remote. Um, not sure how much more to say about that. Mm -hmm. uh, again, if you really, in terms of detecting, yes, in terms of retrieving accurate aerosol properties, especially in the case of mixed aerosol types, it's really better to go to more advanced instruments like Raman or HSRL instruments for that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, question 34, what's the smallest size aerosol that can be reliably detected? Yeah, I um, wasn't, uh, no, I not really thought of it that way, but uh, I would say that we're, we're capable of detecting what I would call normal aerosol size ranges, but not, say, cloud condensation nuclei, mm -hmm. um, which should have been CCN. Sorry. Okay. I've yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll change that. We'll change that. Um, okay. Uh, so, question 35 uh, Is it possible to reactivate an inactive station? Yes, and that happens somewhat frequently. Um, sometimes a site will go down for a longer period of time due to an instrument issue, uh, and then it will become active again. And sometimes uh, uh, more, well, the more frequent scenario is that we did a field campaign somewhere that was short term for maybe a month or two, and then a few years later, uh, we install a permanent station. Okay. Um, question 36, are you aware of environmental agencies, and I guess this is referring to U.S. Uh, environmental agencies, using these instruments for exceptional event demonstrations uh, related to the U.S. Clean Air Act? Or I guess in, if, uh, any, if you know of examples in other countries as well, I guess. Yes, within the U.S., I don't know if, well, I should say for NPLNet, we do not have instruments that are at official EPA sites. Mm -hmm. um, I know of cases where I've been contacted and we pointed them to our data, but I'm not sure to what degree the data were used. Mm -hmm. Certainly not in an official capacity as we're a research mm -hmm. uh, organization. Um, outside the U.S., we do have colleagues, especially in Taiwan, that are working more directly with the local EPA. Mm -hmm. In terms of how they were utilized for exceptional event studies, I would, or I could put you in contact with them if you get a hold of me. Um, okay. You really are doing the data processing and provision. The use yeah. of the data for situations like that uh, tends to be a bit removed. Okay, but it does sound like it. You know, it has been used outside the U.S. Um, it sounds like Taiwan would be the the people to talk to if people were interested in that. Yes, I, I should mention there, there is another project called UCN, uh, which is uh, an effort joint with the EPA to uh, measure the boundary layer height at mm. ham stations. And many of those, uh, many of those groups are doing that by deploying salometers. So there is a growing number of salometers at EPA stations. So you'll probably start to see certainly the use of that data and their measurements of mixed layer heights more and more as time goes on. Okay, great. Um, question 37, what's the advantage of MPL over salometer? I think you addressed this to some extent in a previous question, but if you have anything else to add here, uh, for example, is the unified salometer network going to be included uh, in Galleon? Yeah, so, uh... Well, I'll, I'll take these questions one on each year. The, mm -hmm. So again, the, the MPL still has a better signal to noise and a longer range profiling capability than salometers that are available right now. The CL61, since it is now polarized, is definitely closing that gap. Uh, however, they're still at a near uh, IR wavelength and the data that I've seen so far is still definitely more noisy uh, than the MPL, so you'll have you know, a, a shorter range that they can profile during daytime. 
Uh, however, they're much e easier instruments to deploy and work with. So there are trade-offs between the two. That's why it's, you can't really say one's better than the other. Um, they, they're they built to do, to do slightly different things. Um, so I said, we have intercomparison projects underway now, and I probably have a more concrete answer after those are complete. Um, in terms of UCN joining Galleon, I have uh, had some discussions with them about that. Um, and uh, I'd say they're kind of at an early stage at this point. Okay. Uh, well, I should, should mention oh. uh, other Salometer networks um, I'm also in discussion with, and these would be your operational networks run by the, the weather services. So in Europe, there's eProfile, and they will be joining or added to our Galleon website shortly. Uh, and then the ASOS network within the US, uh, I would like to include their salometer data when it's available or, or metadata into Galleon as well. Okay, great. And then finally, question 38, what is the minimum laser pulse frequency to get good LIDAR retrievals? Well, for the MPL, that's fixed at 2,500 Hertz and it does not vary. Um, in, in general, uh, what you're really after is not the pulse frequency, but a good signal to noise. So it's a, mm -hmm. it's a trade off between your laser pulse energy and the laser pulse frequency. So you're really after an emitted power to get the right signal to noise. And that base, mm -hmm. that's really dependent on your LIDAR design. Mm -hmm. All right, great, thank you. So that was all the questions um, that we collected um, and we'll again be posting this, this document after we finalize it to the training webpage um, in uh, the next week or so. But you know, thank you very much again, Dr. Welton for that, that overview and thank you to the MPLNet team. Um, and more broadly, thank you to all the uh, ground networks, Aeronet, Tollnet, MPLNet and Pandora and the Pandonia network who supported this. Uh, training. And finally, of course, uh, you know, thank you to all our attendees for uh, your attendance and your very uh, interesting and insightful questions uh, throughout the training. Uh, just as a reminder, the homework should be posted to the training webpage. Um, you have about two weeks to complete that homework assignment. And if you do that and also have attended the, the five parts of this training, you should receive a training certificate uh, in uh, about two months or so uh, afterwards. So again, you know, thank you very much, everyone, and uh, we look forward to um, seeing you in future RSA trainings. Yes, thank you, Carl. Thanks, everyone.